Hello there, welcome to this uh, brand new edition of a World Panorama where we get you all the very latest in the international arena. I'm Ashwarya Kapoor. First up, a look at the top stories. Trump orders withdrawal of US military from Syria, claims Islamic State terrorist group defeated. American lawmakers, including Republicans and foreign powers, say move could lead to a resurgence of the terror group. US Defense Secretary Jim Mattis resigns. UK government and EU step up preparations for a no-deal Brexit. Future of the draft deal in UK Parliament uncertain as opposition looks to move no-confidence motion against Prime Minister Theresa May. New UN Pact on Global Migration creates controversy. Critics say it will encourage more illegal migration. Protests in Brussels turn violent. Belgian Prime Minister Charles Michael offers resignation. The top story, President Donald Trump has announced withdrawal of all US troops from Syria, asserting that the Islamic State terrorist group has been defeated. However, his decision has been met with heavy criticism with American politicians as well as foreign powers disputing the claim. Now, they say that the move could lead to a resurgence of the Islamic State terror group. U.S. troops have helped rid much of Syria's northeast of the jihadist group, but pockets of terrorists still remain. Troops are to leave Syria. US President Donald Trump announced on Wednesday, asserting that the Islamic State group had been defeated. The decision upends American policy in the Middle East, marking a swift end to the four year long conflict against the Islamic State there. We've been fighting for a long time in Syria. I've been president for almost two years, and we've really stepped it up, and we have won against ISIS. We've beaten them, and we've beaten them badly. We've taken back the land, and now it's time for our troops to come back home. Trump's move goes against even recent statements by top American military officials who have consistently said it would be wise to stay, as well as Republicans and Democrats who are sharply criticizing the president. Was this decision made with the advice of the military or counter to the advice of the military? That's the first question that I want to know. The decision to withdraw American, uh, an American presence in Syria is a colossal, in my mind, mistake, a grave error that's going to have significant um, repercussions in the years and months to come. But pulling out of the war-ravaged country is a lot easier said than done. Apart from the massive logistical challenge of pulling out more than 2,000 troops, equipment and heavy weapons within the desired time frame, the mission also needs to be carried out in a way that doesn't completely abandon US military allies nor imperil the strategic gains made against the Islamic State group since 2014. The US military allies have expressed caution. However, Russia says the decision could result in genuine prospects for a political settlement. This is, of course, an American decision. We will study the timeline, how it will be done, and the implications for us. We will make sure to maintain Israel's security and protect ourselves from the arena. Islamic State has lost roughly 99% of its territory in Iraq and Syria, but it still poses a security threat. It routinely mounts attacks in Syria despite Trump's declaration that it has been defeated. According to a Pentagon report published in August, IS still has as many as 30,000 fighters in Iraq and Syria. That shows there is a long road ahead for peace. This week, Russia, Iran and Turkey reached an agreement on the composition of a Syria committee which will convene early next year. That would pave the way for the drafting of a new constitution and for elections in Syria. 
I believe that there is an extra mile to go. An extra mile to go. In the marathon effort to ensure the necessary package for a credible, balanced, and inclusive constitutional committee, and for including a balanced chairing arrangement and drafting body and voting threshold. Syria's civil war began in 2011 and has killed hundreds of thousands of people, displaced around half the country's pre-war 22 million population. In September 2014, U.S. began its air campaign against the Islamic State in Syria, launching some 17,000 strikes in the country since then. In late 2015, the first American ground troops entered Syria. They recruited, organized and advised thousands of Syrian, Kurdish and Arab fighters called the Syrian Democratic Forces and pushed IS out of most of its strongholds. The American troops may be moving out of Syria, but it is clear that the road to stabilization in the country is a long one ahead. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis resigned on Thursday, a day after President Donald Trump announced U.S. troops are pulling out of Syria. In a letter to Donald Trump, Mattis suggested that his worldview, which favors traditional alliances and standing up to malign actors, stands at odds with the presidents. Mattis wrote, because you have the right to have a Secretary of Defense whose views are better aligned with yours on these and other subjects, I believe it is uh, right for me to step down from my position. Moments before the Pentagon released Mattis's letter, Donald Trump tweeted that uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis uh, would be retiring with distinction at the end of uh, February adding that he was a great help to me in getting allies in other countries to pay their share of military obligations. Trump did not name a successor, but said that one would be appointed shortly. So what are the ramifications of U.S. Uh, troop pullout from Syria and Afghanistan and also Jim Mattis's resignation? Let's try to understand. We have with us uh, Mr. K.P. Fabian, a former diplomat, joining us in the studio. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us here Pleasure. on Rajasabha Television. Sir, withdrawal of uh, U.S. troops from uh, Syria and some of the troops from Afghanistan has begun. Uh, so what do you think is going to be the impact on the battlefield and also the wider geopolitical ramifications? Let us start with Syria. I have heard uh, security experts in the United States saying that it was a wrong decision, but uh, I beg to differ because uh, we have to understand that in Syria, Russia has local military superiority. And these 2,000 troops which America has, of course, America has contributed to the uh, defeat of uh, uh, IS, you know, Islamic uh, State. Mm -hmm. But Mainly it was done by Russia. And these troops are there, in, as it was mentioned, near the Kurdish region. Yes. And uh, they have been supporting the Kurds. And the Kurds had also taken the lead in, uh, pro in providing the boots on the ground yes. for defeating the IS. Mm -hmm. But basically, uh, America cannot take that much credit for defeating the IS. And Ameri uh, of course, Trump is wrong when he says that it is complete. No, IS is still there. Mm -hmm. But Russia will take care of that. But the larger message is that Trump as candidate had said that America has been, you know, wasting its treasure and lives mm -hmm. uh, in areas which are not of primary security importance in the United States. Right. So, that is the bigger picture. We have to look at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this would also facilitate, Putin has, President Putin has uh, approved what uh, Trump has done. Right. And this will facilitate a political settlement in Syria. Yes. Because the American presence, while it will not make any military difference, it could have uh, made a difference politically. That mm -hmm. is, uh, the Kurds, and also the Free Syrian Army yes. would have been sort of encouraged to mm -hmm. be difficult with uh, Bashar al-Assad. Now, that, is, that difficulty will be reduced 
Mm -hmm. So on the whole, I think it makes sense. And also let's understand that even under Obama, mm -hmm. America intervened militarily in Syria, yes. but in a half-hearted manner, not serious, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, Obama spent, uh, I mean, one of the projects, uh, $500 million mm -hmm. to select and train at least 5,000 Syrians to fight uh, Bashar al-Assad. Mm -hmm. They hardly got 43 or 45. So, you know, American policy in Syria has been rather ineffective and uh, self-defeating. Right. So, it's a logical conclusion. All right. And, and as regards uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, well, there again I can see the American logic. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, let's get it right. America went to Afghanistan in 2001, following 9-11. Yes. America has spent more than one trillion. And uh, how many American lives? More than 2,500 military and uh, contractor. Mm -hmm. In fact, it may be even 3,000. All right. Now, what have they got? Taliban controls half yes. or more of True. the territory. Mm -hmm. The government in Kabul is, well, uh, there's a little corruption there. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands that, and they also admit that. Right. In other words, American presence, military presence, I mm -hmm. mean, in Afghanistan is not doing any good. All right. It is not, America cannot have a military uh, victory in uh, Afghanistan. People, you know, have a wrong conception about America in the sense that if you look at it historically, mm -hmm. Uh, after the Second World War, first major war was Korea. That was a stalemate. America did not win it. Second major war was Afga uh, I mean, uh, Vietnam. America lost the war. Yes. So the be belief that you know there is a problem elsewhere in the world, send the Marines. It will be sorted out. No, that belief is wrong. And those experts, American experts, who say that uh, you know America should have continued uh, yes. in Syria. Mm -hmm. I think they are getting it wrong, except that uh, perhaps Trump could have consulted with his allies mm -hmm. and listened to his own, you know, Pentagon and all that, and announced a decision Later. in a different manner True. rather than just tweeting it. Right. But that is his style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't but approve of that, it, but that, that's his style. Right. But that brings us to another pertinent question is that, Jim Mattis, of course, resigned a day after this announcement. Ever since Donald Trump came to power, a number we have seen a number of resignations, number of firings as well. What are the possible reasons? Well, if I may recall, when Trump was uh, elected, yes, I, even before he took over mm -hmm. the White House, I had written an article, President Donald Trump, colon, a bull in the China shop with a question mark. <laughs> And I had then argued that there was a risk that this re real estate tycoon, mm -hmm. who sort of, you know, is a CEO of yes. a company, mm -hmm. who has a certain style. I mean, he asks his managers, what is it, what is it? And then he just gives his decision. Mm -hmm. He doesn't discuss the decision with them. Yes. Before. A decision with them, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, that style, I had asked whether it is appropriate for the White House. And I'm afraid... Uh, I was uh, right in, you know, expressing those fears. Mm -hmm. I, and uh, I think there is a real problem in the sense that the United States is still the leading power. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever, it may be falling. Yes. But it started falling from such a height that it is still the, yeah. uh, you know, yes. uh, pre I, mean, I mean, the first power, so yes. to say, you know. And what America does makes a difference, not only to America, but also to the rest of yes. us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Trump has to sort of change his style, but I don't expect him to change it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is going to be trouble mm -hmm. for America as well as for the rest of the world. Absolutely. So the presidency of Donald Trump, in fact, uh, has been no stranger to chaos. But uh, recently, of course, uh, the pace of events feels like that it is actually accelerating. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us and sharing your perspective on that entire story. 
And on to the other top story this week. The UK government is uh, stepping up its uh, preparations for a no-deal Brexit, including placing the military on standby. This comes as the future of the Brexit deal. Prime Minister Theresa May has negotiated with the EU, looks increasingly uncertain. Britain has been trying to figure out how to manage a Brexit wherein the UK would leave the European Union since the citizens voted for it in 2016. The European Union has also set out short-term measures to limit the disruption to air traffic, financial services and trade if Britain left the bloc without a deal next March. Brexit rapidly approaches, a pro-European Union boy band made its debut with a ballad dedicated to the British people pleading for them to come back to us because the love is not over. Oh, your voice paints my heart, your mirage fades away. Your choice turns my sky gray. Well, that love story may have been cut short. What Britain and EU are now looking forward to is to ensure that the Brexit divorce is not disorderly. The risks of a ungodly exit of Great Britain from the EU. The risks of a disorderly exit of Great Britain from European Union are clear. It would be an absolute catastrophe. Therefore, the Commission is trying to prevent this disorderly exit from the European Union from happening. But you need two to perform a decent tango. Both sides are now preparing for the worst case scenario. That is, in case the UK leaves the EU in March without a plan, EU has announced temporary measures to try to reduce the impact. That includes measures to limit disruption in certain key areas such as finance and transport. Of course, the best, uh, 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 if we talk in terms of economy and uh, uh, avoiding disruptions, is uh, to stay within the EU. Then, uh, if the decision on Brexit is uh, taken, of course, uh, 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 withdrawal or uh, Brexit with a deal is better than uh, withdrawal uh, with no deal. In uh, case of no deal scenario, of course, doing some preparation to minimize damage is better than not doing any preparation at all. The issue is heating up because British Prime Minister Theresa May's proposed deal, which was agreed with the EU, has so far failed to gain enough support in the UK Parliament, which will vote on it next month. The Prime Minister has delayed a parliamentary vote on the deal until after Christmas and recently survived a vote of no confidence from disgruntled MPs within her own party. If the deal is voted down in Parliament, there is a higher chance that the UK will leave the EU without a deal. We should have had a vote a week ago. We should now be debating practical alternatives. She is behaving in a disgraceful way that is frankly an outrage. Mr Speaker, no deal would be a disaster for our country and no responsible government would ever allow it. However, Theresa May continues to make a plea for Labour to back her Brexit deal. At the final Prime Minister's Questions of the Year, she told MPs that across the House, 80% of them had stood on manifesto pledges, saying they would deliver Brexit. We will, we will set out what is achieved in our EU discussions uh, when we uh, return in the new year, when we have had those discussions, when we bring those assurances back. It is noteworthy that the Brexit deal will only come into force if both the UK and the European Parliament approve it. May has been negotiating a deal with the EU since June 23, 2016, when Britain voted to leave in a referendum. A no-deal Brexit would involve leaving the EU on the March 29 deadline, with no agreement on the future trade and security relationship between the UK and the EU, 
a scenario that both sides are looking to avoid. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. On to the other top story this week, a new UN pact on global migration is proving highly controversial across Europe. It is not legally binding and allows countries to remain in charge of their own immigration policy, but come its signatories uh, to improve a cooperation on international migration. Now, supporters of the agreement say that it will foster cooperation and improve the handling of millions of migrants, but critics fear that it will encourage more illegal migration. Protests held against the agreement in Brussels turned violent and it led to the Belgian Prime Minister Charles Michael offering his resignation. Europe continues to grapple over the issue of migrants. Belgium's Prime Minister Charles Michael submitted his resignation on Tuesday in the face of a populist revolt over his migration policy which opponents say threatens Belgian sovereignty. In office since 2014, Michael lost the support of the biggest party in his coalition, while Belgium's King Philippe has not taken a decision on whether to accept his offer. The resignation has left the residents worried about political stability. I am especially in favour of Prime Minister Charles Michael, but I do not consider his resignation a good thing. We were entering a rather peculiar phase of election preparations and I don't think it is a good thing to have a resignation now. The unrest in Belgium was due to country voting in favour of a UN pact aimed at fostering cooperation on migration. This Wednesday, the United Nations General Assembly formally approved the deal called Global Compact for Migration or GCM to boost global cooperation to tackle rising migration. Negotiations leading to PAC began in 2016, following the arrival of over 1 million people in Europe. The PAC was agreed by all 193 members except the United States in July. At the ceremony to adopt the text on 10 December, only 164 countries formally adopted it. And on Wednesday, the deal was adopted with 152 votes in favour. The GCM is a triumph of multilateralism. It is an assertion of sovereignty acting in concert with other sovereignties for humane objectives. But in no wise does it deny any particle of sovereignty's full extent and reach. The United States, Israel, Hungary, Czech Republic and Poland voted against the voluntary pact which addresses issues such as how to protect migrants, integrate them and send them home. The USA's global approach to the issue was not compatible with its sovereignty. We believe the compact and the process that led to its adoption, including the New York Declaration, represent an effort to advance global governance at the expense of the sovereign right of states to manage their immigration systems in accordance with their national laws, policies and interests. Belgium Prime Minister Charles Michael's problem echoed those of other European leaders, including President Emmanuel Macron of France, who are trying to maintain centrist governments in the face of opposition from both flanks. In Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel, Conservatives and coalition partners have been losing voters to far-right opposition over her 2015 decision to welcome almost one million refugees. Clearly, Europe continues to remain emotive and divided over the issue of migration. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. And here is a look at uh, other key international stories in Globe Watch. The U.S. Federal Reserve uh, raised interest rates on Friday, Wednesday. The rate hike, uh, the fourth of 2018, lifted uh, the target range for the Fed's uh, benchmark uh, overnight lending rate by a quarter of a percentage point to a range of 2.25% to 2.5%. The decision to raise a borrowing cost again is likely to anger U.S. President Donald Trump, who has repeatedly attacked the central banks at tightening this year as a damaging to the economy. However, U.S. Federal Reserve has forecast a fewer rate hikes next year and signaled its tightening cycle is nearing an end. An unlimited number of highly skilled workers from India will be able to migrate to the UK after Brexit in proposals that mark the biggest overhaul of Britain's immigration system in 40 years. 
UK Home Secretary Sajid Javid the published on Wednesday a white paper setting out a new immigration system based on skills and talent and not to where people are from. It announces a complete removal of a cap on the number of work visas issued and ends the system wherein UK employers need to advertise positions to the UK workers first. US capital city Washington DC has sued Facebook over the scandal that broke earlier this year involving Cambridge Analytica's use of data from the social media giant Facebook. It says that Facebook failed to protect the privacy of its users and deceived them about who had access to their data. The lawsuit comes as Facebook faces new reports that it shared its users' data without their permission. It says that this exposed nearly half of the district's residents' data to manipulation for political purpose during the 2016 presidential election. And we end the program with an inspiring story that only proves that however cliched it may sound, age is just a number. A 102-year-old Australian granny has become the world's oldest tandem skydiver. She leaped out of a plane from over 14,000 feet above sea level. Irene Oshia hopes to raise funds and awareness for the Motor Neuron Disease Association of South Australia through her attempt after she lost her daughter to the disease a few years ago. So take a look at these visuals as we take your leave. I'll see you next week with another edition of World Panorama. Bye-bye.